Well, good morning, everyone. It, it is a, a great joy and a privilege to be here this morning. And yes, I have been down in the congregation at various times, and uh, also I've shared at the midweek a few times on behalf of OMS, and indeed we had been invited to your missionary weekend with our stand at one stage as well. And uh, just want to thank the church on behalf of OMS for their, your support over many years. It goes back a long, long way. Uh, in fact, I was in Haiti at one stage, and there was a, a quartet had been here, I think maybe in the 60s, uh, certainly when the Reverend Workman was here, and they had sang in this very church. So OMS, in many ways, uh, has an association with the church here, and we do appreciate a missionary-minded church, and I believe God blesses a missionary-minded church. So thank you for the invitation, and thank you for the warm welcome, and we just trust God will bless our time together today. Now, if you have your Bible with you, perhaps you would uh, go to First Chronicles, please, First Chronicles, and uh, we'll read some verses from chapter 29, 8, and also from 29. That's the book of First Chronicles, chapter 28, commencing to read at verse 20, and then we'll go down into chapter 29 and read some verses there. First Chronicles 28, commencing to read at verse 20, and this is God's word. And David said to Solomon, uh, Solomon his son, Be strong and of a good courage, and do it. Fear not, nor be dismayed, for the Lord God, even my God, will be with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee, until thou hast finished all the work for the service of the house of the Lord. And behold, the courses of the priests and the Levites, even they shall be with thee for all the service of the house of God. There shall be with thee all the manner of workmanship, every willing, skillful man for any manner of service. Also the princes and all the people will be holy at thy commandment. Furthermore, David the king said unto all the congregation, Solomon my son, whom alone God hath chosen, is yet young and tender, and the work is great. For the palace is not for man, but for the Lord God. Now I have prepared with all my might for the house of my God, the gold for the things to be made of gold, and the silver for the things of silver, and the brass of brass, the iron for things of iron, the wood for things of wood, onyx stones and stones to be set, glistering stones and of divers colors, and all manner of precious stones and marble stones in abundance. Moreover, because I have set my affection to the house of my God, I have, of mine own proper, I, have, I have of mine own proper good of gold and silver, which I have given to the house of my God over and above all that I have prepared for the holy house, even 3,000 talents of gold, of the gold of Ophir, and 7,000 talents of fine silver to overlay the walls of the house with all, the gold for the things of gold and the silver for the things of silver, and for all manner of work to be made by the hands of artificers. And then there is a question, and we want to spend some time around this this morning. And who then is willing to consecrate his service this day unto the Lord? And just a few more verses. Go to verse 13. Now therefore, my, our God, we give thee and praise thy glorious name. But who am I and what is my people that we should be able to offer so willingly after this sort for all things come off thee, and of thine own uh, have we given thee. For we are strangers before thee, and sojourners, as were all our fathers. Our days on earth are as a shadow, and there is none abiding. Verse 17. I know also, my God, that thou triest the heart, and hast pleasure in uprightness. As for me, in the uprightness of my heart, I have willingly offered all these things. And now I have seen with joy thy people, which are present here to offer willingly unto thee. Now we'll end our reading there, and we know that God always blesses the reading of his own precious word. We'll have another wee prayer. Our Father, again, we come into thy presence in the name of the Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege of in thy house today. And Lord, we just, the cry of our heart would be that we'd be in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And Lord, we just thank you for the privilege of worshiping thee through these lovely hymns. And we thank you, Lord, for the message contained in them. And we thank you, Lord, for already the blessing we have had in thy house. And now, Lord, we're coming round thy word and we're seeking help from heaven. Lord, in ourselves we're weak. 
Lord, but thou art strong. And so we claim the power of the Holy Ghost. And we pray, Lord, as we would just uh, give a little word this morning, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts would be acceptable in thy sight. For us in the Savior's name I pray. Amen. Well, just as I was uh, considering uh, the meeting this morning, different thoughts have been going through my head, but the Lord just seemed to bring me back time and time again to this question in, the, uh, in 1 Chronicles 29. And even that little hymn we sang there as the offering was being taken up, Jesus, all for Jesus. A life that surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ. In the Western world today, uh, I feel, you know, we're in our comfort zone. And at times the Lord re-challenges us. Really, as our lives all for Jesus. All our ambitions, all our wishes, all our plans are they under the lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ. And David had uh, asked this question in the context of it. David was at the end of his life, still serving God. He had made his mistakes. He had... Uh, been involved in things that he shouldn't be, but as a, as a man, it's recorded of him that he was a man after God's own heart. He was a man who served God. It is one when Paul was preaching at him on his first missionary journey. He said that David served his own generation, and then he fell asleep. He wanted to be with the Lord, and now in heaven. And so David was a man who served his own generation. And that's the only generation we can serve. God hasn't called us to serve a past generation. And he perhaps needs to leave a legacy for the next generation. But this is a generation God has us in. And the same question that David asked his generation is applicable today in Abbott's Cross Church. And this is the question. And who then is willing to consecrate his service this day unto the Lord? You know... Uh, I'm a bit of a sad person. I love Question Time on television. My wife told me, I sit up to watch Question Time uh, when it's on on Thursday night. Love to hear questions. Love to hear the answers, how they're given. And if you go to God's Word, there's some tremendous questions. And at the start of this year, the Lord started bringing me some of these questions. It was a question for those who are outside of Christ. And, and the Philippian jailer asked it, what must I do to be saved? That's a great question. Sometimes using the missionary context, uh, Isaiah, the questions asked there, who, uh, who will I send and who will go for us? Here are the people that's already at Bible college and they've answered that question and they said, Lord, here am I, send me. Some tremendous questions in the Word of God and they challenge us. And I think questions are a great way of challenging us. Here's a question in God's Word this morning, and we just want to spend a little bit of time about it, and we want to really think about it, because it's applicable to everyone in this meeting. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's applied to believers. You can't serve the Lord if you haven't had a saving experience, and you can be saved this morning, and you can go to this meeting ready to serve the Lord. I was just thinking when I was about this message and, 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 and Paul was on his way to persecute the church and the Lord just came and dealt with him. And as soon as he was saved, you know what Paul said, Lord, what will you have me to do? You can go to this meeting this morning saved and ready to serve and live for the Lord Jesus Christ. But this message is particularly uh, to words of believers. The words of those that are know the Lord Jesus Christ as personal Savior. And who then is willing to consecrate his service this day unto the Lord? A wee hymn that had been going through my mind and I couldn't get out of it. And in fact, when I was over visiting some of our missionaries in uh, England recently, and I'm a bit sad, I went down to see the grave of this person, a hymn writer by the name of Francis Ridley Harvard Grave. And she wrote some lovely hymns, but the one she most, uh, best, is best known for is, Take my life, and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my, mom take my moments and my days and let them flow in ceaseless praise. You know, all those words are easy to, they're all easy to say. And it's so easy to sing, you know, to all for Jesus and all of my ambitions, wishes, and plans. Easy to sing. 
But you know, it's not always as easy when it comes down to the application. And so as we look at these verses this morning, we just want to have a few simple thoughts about this question that David, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, asked in the Word of God, who then is willing to consecrate his service this day, this generation, this month, this year, who then is willing to consecrate his service this day unto the Lord? Now, there's a challenge here, and it's a challenge for everyone. It says, who then? Who then? It's not for the educated. It's not for the high and mighty, and it's for them too, by the way. But you'll find God just uses ordinary people. God normally uses just the five eights, like myself. And when he uses the five eights, you know the glory can only go to God. Indeed, you've heard of D.L. Moody, and he was sitting in a meeting. He was a, soul, uh, uh, he was a shoe salesman. In my time, I'd been a salesperson for over 30 years, or for 30 years to be exact. And then God called me out of that to serve him in a full-time capacity, representing a missionary organization. But D.L. Moody was sitting in a meeting, and you probably don't hear of this man often, and a man by the name of Henry Varley made this comment. He said, the world has yet to see what God can do with and for and through a man who is fully and wholly consecrated to him. That was a, 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 that was a challenge. And Moody was sitting in that meeting and he went home and the thoughts went through his mind. He kept thinking, he said, the world has yet to see with and for and through and in a man. He said, Varley meant any man. He said, Varley didn't say he had to be educated. He didn't have to be brilliant or anything else. He just said a man that was willing to consecrate his life fully to God and to be let the Holy Spirit take control. And then Moody said, by God's grace, I'll be that man. I'll be one of those men. And God took Moody and in his generation, he spoke to over a hundred million people, and only God keeps the records, but it's believed he's seen over a million people come to see Christ. And so the challenge this, this morning, and we maybe think, oh, it's for somebody else, it's for the pastor, but as God comes to your heart, the question and the challenge is this, who then? And when David was throwing out this challenge, he was a man coming to the end of his life. He was a man who would love to have built the temple. If you take the context, he would love to build this house of God. And he said, God says to him, no, David, you can't build it. It's going to be your son's going to build it. But David got involved in the planning and in the preparation and the motivating the people to get behind his son. And even up to the day he died, God was serving the Lord. Can I tell you, you don't have to be a young person and praise God. God calls young people. But he calls middle-aged people. He calls retired people. He needs everyone to have this commitment, no matter what stage of their life they're at. And the challenge is to who then is to everyone. Now, we're not building a big temple or anything in these days. The, the application today, the Lord Jesus said, I will build my church. Didn't say he might build it. It's a fact, I will build my church. And he said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And he's still building it. And the amazing thing about it is God involves us in that church. He involves us in building the church. And you know, he'll build it whether you and I don't get involved, whether we get involved or not. He's going to build his church. He is building his church. There's areas of the world today, there are many come and know the Savior. There's areas of the world, there's a real drought. And in this part of the world, we've sang the hymn, Revive thy work, O Lord. We need a revival in the United Kingdom. We need a revival in Europe. Europe is now the continent that nears the he needs the gospel. It used to be the continent that brought the gospel to the world. But now it's a continent that needs the Savior. And many of, our, of the believers were resting on our laurels. And we need to all, oh, sometimes to be shook up. And the Lord comes and he gives us a challenge. And he says, who then? Who then is willing to consecrate his service this day, this generation, unto the Lord. And perhaps that challenge has gone out this morning. And I don't know your circumstances. God be, could be calling you into the Sunday school. 
could want you to be involved in outreach. He could want you to be involved in the crash. He could want you to be involved in the work and you're sitting back and you're not mentioning. I don't know what God's saying this morning, but I know he's putting out a challenge. And I know for those who take up the challenge, he'll use them mightily. Who then is willing to consecrate his service this day unto the Lord? There's a challenge. I thought about Esther. I heard someone speaking recently on Esther, and it re-challenged me again. And she was, it came down to the thing that Esther was used for such a time as this. And just in your situation, in your circumstances, God might be the person that he just needs for that situation, for that very time, for that very place. It could be for a deacon on the oversight. It could be for someone on the door. Or it could be someone to go to the, 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 the further end of the earth with the gospel, telling men and women, boys and girls, they need to be saved. I don't know. But Esther... And you know the whole story about Esther, and you know about Haman, and you know about Mordecai, her uncle, and you know how all the Jewish people was going to be blotted out. The plot was set, and Mordecai sent a message to Esther, his niece. Would you go and speak to the, queen, the king? And now she was five years as queen at this stage. And she'd got into all the comforts of being a queen, and all the, the things that had went with it. And she sent back the word to, really to, to Mordecai and said, basically, I, I can't do it because really it puts my life at risk and all of that. And Morde, Mordecai is sent back to his niece and he said, I'll tell you something. He said, God will use somebody else, basically, if, he doesn't, if, if you don't do it. God will still raise up somebody, but you'll miss out because I can tell you, you'll perish too. And he said, do you know something? God just might have brought you to the kingdom for such a time as this. And that's often quoted in the Lord's work. God is just the right person at the right time. But you have to step into the gap. And Esther, thank God, she, raised, she rose up to the occasion. She says, wait, if I perish, I'll perish. I'll go in and I'll bring, I'll bring the, the supplication before the king. And she says, you get to fasting and the implication is to the praying and we'll do that too. And I'll go in and see the king. And she did. And a nation was saved. But you had to be willing. And there she was queen for five years. She got the challenge. Would you go into the, and she was nearly going to back out. And then she went in. And she faced the challenge. And a nation of Israel was saved. A nation that would bring the Savior. A nation that still wanted to be wiped out today. But a nation that the people hated. A nation that the, de the devil hated. But Esther stepped up to the mark. Oh, she says, I'm queen now. I have all the fancy goods. I'm comfortable. I don't want to rack all that. But the challenge came. It was her time. And I just wonder, is there someone this morning in the meeting and God has been speaking to your heart? He has just a wee job for you. And you say, well, you couldn't say, all oh, my ambition. My ambition, you know, the promotion's come and I couldn't do it. All of my ambitions... Wishes and plan, you have to lay them all at the Lord's feet. You know, I was thinking about this because people get so caught up in life and the boy on the platform's just to see him. But you know, when David was praying that prayer and it caught me this morning, he was praying to God and he was thanking God for the people who had willingly came and done what he asked them to do. And that verse 14 of, uh, of chapter 29, it says, For we are strangers before thee. We're strangers and pilgrims on earth, friends, this morning. He says, we're just sojourners, as we're all our fathers. Now, the believer's not greatly loved the day either, just trust me. You'll not always be popular if you live up and out for God. And he says, as we're our fathers, our days on earth are as a shadow. Our days on earth are as a shadow. David got that implication that our days are just but a shadow. Just but a shadow. And it's really only what, for Christ, what we do for Christ will really last. There's a challenge today. Who then? And not only is there a challenge here, but you know, there's, and, and I have a wee poem here, and, and I'm going to read it to you a couple of verses of it. In our mission, there's an old man by the name of Dr. Wesley Jewell, and he's now 97. 
and uh, I was over at meetings this year again, and he had been in Ulster many times and has preached in this country, and he has, he has two tremendous books, one called Mighty Prevailing Prayer. We're talking about prayer with boys and girls. God answers prayer, trust me. He answers it every day. Marvelous. And he has another one called Touch the World Through Prayer. And you talk about somebody working his at his office every day. He's reduced his hours now from 10. He comes at 10 o'clock and he works to 3. Because his wife insists he goes home. But he wrote a wee poem one time and it was this here. I challenge you. I challenge you at this crisis hour to take up your cross in the Savior's power. Oh, do something worthy for God and man. Come sacrifice all for the Savior's plan. I challenge you now when the need is great. I challenge you now when the hour is late. Remember how brief is your life's short span. Oh, do something worthy for God and man. There's a challenge. Who then? And I don't know who God's speaking is. I trust he's speaking to us all, including this boy here. But the question really is, who then? There's a challenge. Who then is willing to consecrate a service this day unto the Lord? There's a challenge here, but there's always also a choice. Who then is willing? Who then is willing? God doesn't put your arm up your back. He doesn't need to, by the way. He doesn't want people that you have to put the arm up the back. He wants those that are willing. Who then is willing? He wants someone to put up their hand and say, Here am I, Lord, use me. Take me, just as I am. I'm, a, I'm available. One has said God's not looking for your ability. He's looking for your availability. Another quote is, God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the called. Oh, I couldn't do that. And that may be possible. And some people think they can do things they can't do. But I can tell you this much, if God calls you and for a specific task, he'll equip you to do it. Oh, you'll have that excuse too. Oh, I couldn't do it. I've said it many times. But you know, I was thinking about this choice. And as you go to Scripture, the sad thing is, and the, the Lord's work, and you know all these verses, they've been quoted in this church many times, and they're still through today. The harvest truly is great. So it is. An amazing harvest. Never was a bigger harvest than in 2013. Biggest harvest ever was of souls. It always has been this situation. But the laborers are few. You say, well, there's not that many willing, really. You go to the most people living in the ski, well, I can't, you know. Who then is willing? There's a choice to be made. God could be tugging at your heart today and he's taking you out of your comfort zone and he wants you to do something amazing for him. Or, and that amazing thing could be a very small thing, by the way, but still amazing. And God's asking you, who then is willing? I was down in the Republic of Ireland last week doing some outreach with our mission and, and there was two lads with me and one of them was a, a great lad. He came from the Roman Catholic background. The Lord saved him just over a year and a half ago, Michael. And he wanted to go down to do outreach with the background of being a Catholic to people from his own background to tell them they needed the Savior. And I don't know how they got into the book of Ezekiel. The other boy was talking about the book of Ezekiel. And I says, there's a, there's a, there's a question in, in Ezekiel, a sad verse in Ezekiel. And you know, still through the day, Ezekiel 22 and 30, And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand the gap before me in the land, that I should not destroy it. And here's another but. But I found none. Found none. Found none. The boy says, are you sure that's in the Bible? I said, it is, and it could be written the day too, and many is a situation. There's a world that's lost and going out into a lost eternity. And God calls many a man and he puts his ambition, he puts his plans, he puts his wishes. I've been there. It's all of those things before what God's asking him to do. And he's looking for a man and he found none. I wonder, could that be said to you that God's looking for you this morning? And by the way, I just want to say this because we, this is for believers and, and this thought can be, God's always looking for people. That's amazing. We should be looking for him. And you could be in this meeting this morning and you don't know the Savior. 
and he's looking for you. God's always searching for a man, a woman, a boy, a girl. And here, here in the gospel it says, for the Son of Man is to come to seek and to save that which was lost. And as I said earlier, you could be outside of Christ and say, this is not really relevant to me, this morning done is totally relevant to you. God's seeking you and he could save you and make, use you mightily. You don't usually find that people that's really useful in the first year and a half after they're saved. They're full fling fire. They want to tell everybody they're, they're, they're lost. It's new to them. And then we get stuck. The Lord didn't say to get saved and stuck. He said to get saved and serve. And that involves me. And there's a challenge comes this morning. And we could say much about that. And I'm glad that clock's the back because my watch is going slow. And if I go on too long, I know you'll have to turn the light off on the way out, you know. So there's no, well, the light's on the night, you'll maybe have to turn it off. But there's a challenge here. There's a challenge. And the Lord brought me to this wee verse of Scripture just to share down here at Albert's Cross this morning. The challenge is, who then? I'm looking at you all. And a lot of fingers back of the boy here. Who then is willing? That's the choice. God's asking you to do something. Who then is willing? There's a choice to be made. There's a challenge. You know, I'd written down about Isaiah. I've mentioned him already. Isaiah went through. He met the Lord. The year that King Uzziah died. But the king of kings was still on the throne. You've often heard it. And he came and he challenged Isaiah. And Isaiah saw a sinful state. And he got right with God. And then the challenge came. And the Lord asked the question. Whom will I send and who will go for us? Isaiah says, here am I. Send me. That could be happening in this very meeting this morning. And I wonder, will you put up your meeting on this morning and say, here am I, Lord, just send me. There's a choice to be made. And you know, there used to be the wee, the wee chorus across the street or across the sea. And I was looking at Don Coulter's version there last night. And it could be across the counter. It could be in the shop, couldn't it? Maybe God's asking you in your place of work just to be that we up the ante a wee bit and share the glorious message of the gospel. It could be across the classroom for the school children, telling, not easy at school to tell other boys and girls and see you, but it could be across the classroom, couldn't it? It could be, I live in a cul-de-sac, it could be across the cul-de-sac. It could be across the county. It could be across the country or it could be across the continent. But God is asking you to make a choice. Who then is willing. And you look at this verse of scripture, who then, you have a challenge. And it's not only a challenge, there's a choice to be made. Who then is willing? And there has to be a change. Not only a challenge, not only a choice, but a change. Who then is willing, and this is it, to consecrate his service next week? No, this day. Under the, there has to be a change. I like the writings of Leonard Ravenhill, but I, I heard him speaking on a tape recently. And he said this question, he said this here, and it, it caught my attention. He said, you know, people say to me in the door, I've been challenged, brother. I've been really challenged this morning. But he says, I don't really want to see people challenged. I want to see people changed. Because you go to meetings, more and more meetings, and people are challenged. And they've been really challenged. And they say, I, I, I've been really challenged today. But he says, they're good, and they're never changed. And they not only hear today a challenge, who then is willing, and there's not only a choice to be made, who then is willing, but there's a change to perhaps come about. Who then is willing to consecrate his service this day unto the Lord? There's a lot we could say about consecration, the meaning of it. And uh, looking a wee bit at it this morning, and I'm not a Greek scholar or a Hebrew scholar, but it's a, a deep word to really consecrate. But it means really to surrender your all to God. It means to be obedient to whatever he tells you to do. It means to be ready. It means that he's first in your life. It means that like the chorus we've sang earlier, that all our ambitions, wishes, and plans are out the window. It's all for Jesus. Every part of your life. Nothing comes before it. Not the wee bits. 
F. B. Meyer uh, uh, of a past generation. The Lord really challenged them, and he hadn't all his life, and he, he threw out his keys, and he says, Lord, take the keys of my life. Didn't let him in control. But he's really in control of your life. You see, we like to be in control, don't we? I love to be in control a wee bit. I don't know what's happening. But the Lord, he wants control. That's what it means, really. This is where the change comes. Now you say, well, I'm not really selfish. Oh, we are very often selfish. Of all our we ambitions and all the rest of it, and it has to go. The consecration of life is not only a theme of vital importance, but it's an act of obedience to God, which brings tremendous blessing into the heart and life of the one utterly surrendered to God. Then the question is, is our life self-pleasing, self-choosing, self-indulgence, or where self is crucified, self-pleasing is renounced, and life absolutely surrendered to God? That's a change. That's a change. And I can tell you, it's a big challenge. And I can tell you that's very relevant to my own life. I wouldn't be sharing it with you if it's not. This word of meaning, it means fullness of hands. If you, if you look down there in the Bible, if you have a mind and have a margin, you'll see a wee mark beside concentrate, and you'll see in the, in the margin, fill his hands. It brought to me a wee song. This is what Matthew Henry said about the filling of our hands with the service of God intimates that we must serve him only, serve him liberally, and serve him in the strength of grace derived from him. And you know, it makes that wee hymn uh, by a, a songwriter, Charles Luther, it means a lot more when he asked the question, must I go and empty handed, thus my Redeemer meet? Not one day of service give him, lay no trophy at his feet. Must I go empty handed? Must I meet my Saviour so? Not, was, not one soul with him to greet him, must I empty handed? Go. Those are challenging questions. They're a challenge to me. And the Word of God would come to us our hearts this morning, and He wants us all. When you really study up the chapters on consecration, and go into Exodus, and how the priest, and how Aaron, and how his sons were consecrated, and how they were cleansed, and how there was a sacrifice made, and how they were anointed with oil. You'd find some of the things that happened was that Aaron and, and, and the sons and the priests, the blood was put on their ear. It was put on their hands. It was put on their feet. You want an application for that? The consecration of the priest in Exodus 29, the blood was put upon the ear. The Godward faculty suggesting a tent of obedience. Are we really listening to God this morning, what he's saying to our heart? And are we being attentive and are we being obedient? And then the blood upon the foot is the earthward faculty, suggesting a holy walk. When we often have to challenge our life about our walk with God, I have to. And by nature, I'm a wayward creature. But I'll tell you, God wants the blood upon our foot, our earthward faculty. Suggesting a holy walk. And then the blood upon the hands is a manward faculty. Speaking and suggesting of active service. Are we in active service for the Lord today? By the way, that could be at home praying. That's hard work. Most of our prayer warriors know the mess or have even grayer hair than I have. Boy, we couldn't do without them. They pray us through every situation. Pray missionaries onto the field. Keep missionaries on the field. Pray down the blessing of God for the salvation of souls, for churches to be built. They pray down the blessing for where there's need, where there's injury, where there's disease, where there's danger. Thank God for all the hard work and believers. And then the oil was plied. We can't do the work without the power of the ungrieved Holy Ghost. And so there's a, there's a challenge. Who then? There's a choice. Who then is willing? And there's a chain. Who then is willing to consecrate his service this day? He wants, your, he wants your all. 
He wants your all. He wants your time. He wants your talents. He wants your toil. He wants your treasure. He wants your touch. He wants your tears. He wants your thoughts. He wants your thrust. He wants your throat. He wants your all. He wants my all. Campbell Morgan said that to know God is to serve him. All failure in his service is the result of loss of vision of God, misapprehension of him due to some distance from him. God wants us changed and living for him. Takes me back to Francis Ridley Harbour's song. And can we really sing it and mean it this morning to take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee? Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice and let me sing always only for my king. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages from thee. Take my silver. Oh, and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. Take my intellect and use every power as thou shalt choose. Take my will and make it thine, it shall be no longer mine. Take my heart and thine alone, it shall, shall be thy royal throne. Take my love, my Lord, I pour at thy feet its treasure store. Take myself and I will be ever only all for thee. And so as we wrap up this little message this morning, and as this question has been asked, and who then is willing to consecrate his service this day unto the Lord? I hope you have seen this a challenge. Who then? And that means you don't look at the boy beside you. It's me, isn't it? Who then? It's a challenge. And it's not only that, there's a choice to be made. Who then is willing? Not only is there a challenge and not only is there a choice, perhaps there's a change to be made. Who then is willing to consecrate his service this day unto the Lord? That's the charge. It's not unto the congregational movement. It's not under, unto one mission society. It's not unto any denomination. This charge is, you're asked today, it's unto the Lord. That makes it all different. It takes it up to a different league altogether. We have to consecrate our life unto the Lord. And I'll tell you, you see that word Lord, it'll be spelt in capitals in your Bible, Lord. It's a tremendous word. In Genesis 1, he's only called God. And then in Genesis 2, he's introduced as the Lord God. The God of heaven, the God of creation. The God who put us here. The God who made everything. The God who's eternal. The God who never changes. The God who's omnipotent. The God who created this world, very quickly in Genesis 2, he comes into the Lord God, meaning he's someone person, and he wants to deal with human beings. He wants to talk with you. He wants to be relate to you. And even after the fall of man, he came in the garden and as the Lord God, and he says, where art thou? And he made a sacrifice. And the same Lord God and the same Lord of the Old Testament is the same Lord of the New Testament. It tells us he left heaven's glory and he came to an earth of woe. He went to a place called Calvary and he shed his precious blood that you and I might know our sins forgiven and one day go to heaven for all eternity. Doesn't matter how, how, how long you live, it's a short little period of time. It's that shadow that David talked about. And it's only what we, if we come to him, we have to be saved on earth. There's only hope, no hope after that. But you know if the Lord has saved you, he wants her all. He's worth it all. He wants us to serve him. The charge is on to the Lord. And after Paul came to the Savior, he said, Lord, what will you have me to do? And after that, he acknowledged the Lord first in his life. He said, it's the Lord who, who owns me and the Lord whom I serve. That's the charge. Well, there's many examples we could give you, but we'll, we'll maybe leave it with... Uh, one or two, Jonathan Edwards, I read up on him. Jonathan Edwards was used of God in America in the 1740s. Great spiritual awakening. One of the greatest theologians who ever lived. And this is what he said, I claim no right to myself, no right to this understanding, this will, these affections that are in me. Neither do I have any right to this body or its members, no right to this tongue, to these hands, to these feet, or to these eyes. I have given myself clear away and not retained anything of my own. 
And then God took up Jonathan Edwards, even though he was an intellect, but he saw a mighty awakening in New England. And I think it was over two million people came to Christ in about two years. If it was the population today, it would be 28 million, 10% of the population. And of another wee one here, and with this I do end, and it's a more modern one, it's a young pastor in Africa, and this is what he had on his wall, I'm part of a fellowship of the unashamed, I have stepped over the line, the decision has been made, I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ, I won't look back, let up, slow down, back away or be still. He said, my past is redeemed, my present makes sense, my future is secure, I am finished and done with low living, sight walking, small planning, smooth knees, colorless dreams, tame visions, mundane talking, cheap living and dwarf goals. He said, I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotions, plaudits or popularity. I don't have to be right. First tops, recognized, praised, regarded, rewarded. I now live by faith, lean on his presence, walk by his patience, lifted up by prayer and labor by his power. My face is salt, my gate is fast, my goal is heaven, my road is narrow, my way rough, my companions few, my guide reliable, my mission clear. I cannot be bought, deluded or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, hesitate in the presence of the adversary, negotiate at the table of the enemy, or meander in the maze of mediocrity. I won't give up, shut up, let up, until I have stayed up, stored up, prayed up, paid up, preached up for the cause of Christ. I am a disciple of Jesus. I must go till he comes. Give till I drop, preach till I know, and, uh, and work till he stops me. And when he comes for his own, he'll have no problem recognizing me. My banner will be clear. To bring our meeting to a close, can I ask the question from God's word? And who then is willing to consecrate his service this day unto the Lord. May the Lord bless you.